I'm an automotive technician. I have been for 15 years and dealt a lot with uh, extended warranty companies, Ford warranty, I worked for Ford, um, and uh, saw a couple of needs that were, that were missing in the system. There was uh, areas where warranty companies were able to get out of paying claims for customers. And uh, I had recently joined a cost sharing group for healthcare because the costs were much lower and they had a little bit better service. There wasn't so many loopholes for them to get out of paying for stuff. And it really intrigued me that the cost sharing system was working so well for the healthcare industry. So I was working one day and had a customer that came in and uh, had a failed water pump on their vehicle. And unfortunately that damaged the engine to the point of where it needed to be replaced. Um, the warranty company declined to pay for the engine. They only wanted to pay for the water pump, which was $83. It needed a $7,000 engine. And they, they were trying to get out of uh, taking care of that customer. And that's when I realized that there needs to be something else where you know you could have a group of people come together and, and take care of each other better. And, and we started to put together the idea of cost sharing for automotive repairs. Never been done before. And, um, and it, that's really where the beginning was. We went, uh, went to the state first to, to talk about uh, uh, what we needed to do, what, uh, what kind of regulations are out there. Found out pretty quickly there were no answers. Nobody could really give us a clear direction on what this company would look like, what it would need to be. Um, what we did get from the insurance department was that cost sharing was not regulated and uh, we technically did not fit the, the bill of an automotive warranty company. So there was no real area for us to be. Um, we went to a, a lawyer who said, you know, you're just going to need to, you know, do it and, uh, and, and kind of see what happens, see what comes up. Um, we organized the company and, and it worked great. People were really happy. We were providing a service that, uh, that they really enjoyed. Um, we were able to keep the costs down uh, for each repair, um, but still be able to take care of the customer. We're avoiding those situations, like I had explained, where we're getting out of paying things. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to provide a better product. Um, and at a cheaper rate, and we, we really achieved that. It was pretty successful. So I think that there were some competitors that were upset with the way that we were approaching things, and maybe they felt like we weren't playing by the same rules they were. Um, and uh, unfortunately, whoever went to the insurance department, I don't, I'll never know because they, they did it anonymously. Um, the insurance department looked into us and found out that we weren't complying with the regulations to be a warranty company, and that's where all the trouble started. Well, we were told that we, we, must, uh, we must stop. We couldn't, couldn't sell any more memberships, and uh, we, had to, we had to make everybody whole um, that we could. So we, we took every, every dollar we had and tried to give all the money back that we could to every person that signed up, and then we took the responsibility of the existing claims that had been made on ourselves and paid them ourselves. Entrepreneurs like Alex Carter deserve more than an up or down vote from regulators. Technology has allowed for all kinds of disruptions in a wide variety of industries, and all too often, some innovative ideas are shut down simply because the law hasn't caught up yet. Countries all around the world and states like Utah have started addressing this problem by implementing a new regulatory framework called a sandbox. It's a different legal approach to regulating businesses that allows for entrepreneurs to test their innovations under a regulator's lighter oversight. Novel financial products, technologies, and business models can be tested under a set of rules, supervision requirements, and appropriate safeguards, rather than being shut down up front since they don't comply with existing laws. What kind of companies can be in a sandbox? There are numerous options, ranging from new kinds of insurance to disruptive health technologies to drones. The options are as limitless as the creativity of the entrepreneurs coming up with the new business models and products. For their part, regulators put themselves in as open of a position as possible, welcoming new models rather than preemptively putting a stop to them. I understand what the insurance department's looking for. They're looking to protect the consumer and, and make sure that they're you know, not being cheated or anything like that. But um, cost sharing is not a new idea. It's been happening for decades and it works pretty darn well for healthcare. And we were just applying the same idea to automotive repairs. And when you're open and you're transparent and the consumer knows what they're getting, they're happy. They, they, they were extremely pleased with the level of service we provided. Um, so I, I think that we, you know, given the opportunity, could, could really make a difference in that industry and provide a great service for the customer. It's important to remember that the goal of protecting consumers is not lost within a regulatory sandbox. Guidelines and guardrails like consumer transparency, inspections, audits, and the like are not thrown out. 
Instead, regulators work alongside companies to examine what long-term regulation is needed, or more importantly, not needed. Here in Utah, we have an established sandbox for financial companies, and last August, the courts approved a pilot program for allowing a legal services sandbox. For innovative business models like the one Alex Carter was pursuing at Otmo.com, an insurance sandbox is most likely the best next stop to remedying the roadblocks that he and other entrepreneurs are running up against. Kentucky and Vermont have already implemented sandboxes like this, and Utah should follow them in the goal of allowing innovation to take hold in an otherwise dormant industry. When we started getting those demands to, to stop business, it was, it was like a kick in the gut. It was, it, was, it was terrible, and we had to refund everybody that had already paid in the back and we weren't able to get everybody refunded just because there just was no funds there so uh, it was it really devastated our our finances my wife and I would and uh, to date it's it's net loss of about two hundred thousand dollars is what it cost us personally there were so many people who were like you just need to go just bankrupt it and, and run and it, that's we weren't having it that's not that's that was the whole idea was taking care of that I started the company because of how I saw these insurance companies, these warranty companies, just taking advantage of people. You know, it, it, you want to talk about protecting the consumer, they're not. These guys that have the contracts were not doing it. We were. You know, it, it was a better product by far. Regulatory sandboxes offer an opportunity for companies and regulators to work together in pursuit of innovation and a stronger economy. Utah should continue on the good work it has done in transforming the beehive state into the sandbox state. I do feel like there needs to be a way for uh, state regulators to be able to work with innovative companies to, instead of shutting them down, give them the ability to, to flourish and grow.